All right, I guess we're starting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to Friends in Austin. Today I have Andrew Michael on the podcast. He has a company and a community called Lone Star Dads. And I purposely didn't research too much into it past, you know, what we had talked about already. Right. And so could you tell me, because I have no, I don't even know how you guys make money. I don't know how it originated. Can you give us the company in a nutshell? Yeah. So it started about three months ago in May 29th is when I actually created the Facebook group. Right. And so it all started as a Facebook group. I had a full time job, salary position. It was a well paying job. I was making $90,000 a year, four kids. Um, this is my first job I've had since I got out of the army eight years ago. Right. So it's been a big, <laughs> a big adjustment working at a job. But I started three months ago, May 29th, middle of the pandemic, and it just took off and it just blew up fast. And so uh, what I promised myself, I've done. Uh, communities in the past. I created a military veteran entrepreneur group in the past, and I made money by selling to the members. Uh, and they caused a lot of issues with selling to members. People feel kind of dirty or like they're being capitalized on. And so I decided I wanted to do this one a bit different. And so what I decided is I'm not going to charge the guys anything to be part of this community. I'm going to make money off of businesses. It's always easier to sell to businesses than it is to sell to a consumer, All right? Businesses want exposure in front of an audience. Once you build an audience, they'll pay for that exposure. So that's how I started, I, I started capitalizing on it. As we began growing, as we began getting on the news, we've been featured on every TV news outlet in Austin in how, three months. How did that happen? Did they come to you? Did you hit them up? I hit them up. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I didn't have money for marketing. I had a, my job, but my job was paying my bills. So I had to figure out what is free marketing? What What is going to cost me nothing to get the word out? And so what I did was I hit up the news, Fox News, KVU, KXAN, CBS. I hit them all up. And they all, uh, one after another, started saying yes. And so over time, I had Fox, KVU, and KXAN within like three, four weeks of each other. Uh, CBS, I just did like last week or two weeks ago, and that will be live sometime in mid-September. Oh, cool. And so, and then I had Spectrum News as well. So I've done all the TV news outlets, so I've tapped out of that in Austin. But next is print and and magazines and other blogs and going after that route as well. Can you promote my podcast for me? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going up on the group, so the guys will see this. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I'm impressed that you were able to do all that and get all that traction without – did, did you not pay any money for marketing? You did all that for free? Like yeah, I did all that for free. So uh -huh. one thing I do when I build communities is I do giveaways. So I do spend money that way. Um, what I've learned is I'm running Facebook ads now, but that's because I have money to run Facebook ads. Before, yeah. I didn't. And so when I didn't have that, the way I would build, I build communities is I build the group, right? And I always go after a very specific audience. Uh, this one, I, it had to be more purpose-filled. So I was like, I love being a dad. It's the number one thing in my life, the most important thing. Money used to be the most important thing, even as a father. And I built a successful PR company, did really well, but I just spent no time with my kids. So I wanted to have purpose. And so I was like, all right, let me serve a dad audience because I can understand them. I can relate to them. And it's the most important thing for me. And I know it's the most important thing for them. So I did that. And what I did was I just got off on the tangent. I completely forgot what we're talking about. Is oh, how I build my community. So yeah. what I did was I ended up, doing giveaways. So I'm like, Hey, invite so many dads uh, that, you know, in Austin to join the Facebook group. And every time that you invite one dad, your name goes into the drawing one time. And I've given away a smoker. I've given away uh, a free boat rental and I give away things to get the guys to invite other dads to join the community. And that's how I built it. And that you're spending a little bit of money, but not nearly as much as you would on like a Facebook ad because Facebook ads are hit or miss, right? You got to spend money to figure out if it works and then you got to adjust. And I've never had success with Facebook ads. Yeah. I'm trying to use them right now. And like some of them will get like, you'll get 3000 views on one, but does that trans, it doesn't translate to, to that many people, you know, becoming part of your community or following you or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's because there's so many, I mean, all you need is a dollar a day to advertise on Facebook. So the amount of people advertising is just, the competition is ridiculous. So I focus more on the organic approach where the guys come in because friends invited them and word of mouth marketing has always been the number one marketing that exists, right? I don't it think is. it will ever be beat because that's just, it's friends telling you. And your, I think your community lends itself towards being very successful with that. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure every community can be successful with that, but I think that's a particularly good one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the thing is, is there's like, 
it's not just a Facebook group, right? A lot of people build a Facebook group to build a community to be able to advertise and make money. I didn't go that route. I built a community of guys. Facebook group is just happens to be the channel, right? It doesn't mean that this is, I don't consider it a Facebook group. A group is just the channel that we use, but it's not like a buy, sell trade group. It's not like a free stuff in Austin group. It, it's a community of men having real conversations about real struggles or real experiences. So I have specific rules. We don't commu- talk about re- politics or religion. That was, that's a great rule because that would just be awful to get on there in that community and just see a bunch of threads and arguments about politics and religion. Yeah, I mean, that's what all Facebook is. And so I wanted to create a channel within Facebook that isn't negative, that isn't about fighting or arguing about masks or politics or who, what God you should believe in or anything like that. I wanted it a safe environment where anyone and everyone is welcome, straight, gay, atheist, Christian, you know, black, white, brown, whatever. Everybody is welcome there and feels welcome and doesn't have to constantly worry about being sold into a specific mindset or belief system. Have you had any trouble um, moderating that or people pretty much abide by not talking about politics and religion and stuff like that on there? Everybody in there abides by it. I've had a few guys get upset about it, right? And those guys ended up leaving the group where I had so far, I mean, three months in, I've only had to remove two or three guys from the group, which is really low numbers compared to how fast we've grown. Mm -hmm. Uh, So everybody really respects it. I think everybody appreciates the fact that I'm not doing it to be hateful or because I believe in a specific thing and I don't want them talking about anything I don't believe in. It's simply... Let's keep it positive. Let's keep it uplifting. Let's not make this a community where it's like the rest of Facebook because Facebook is exhausting. It's terrible for that reason. You're absolutely right. Who wants to open it up and see people arguing about stuff or just posting one thing about their belief or another? Yeah. Facebook started as kind of just seeing what your friends were up to, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Yeah, and it's definitely changed a lot (laughs) since then. Which is understandable. Yeah. So... It's only been three months. You've been doing this for three months, and you're not, you quit your job already? Yeah, I quit my job two weeks in. Jeez, two <laughs> weeks in, man. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, two weeks in, I started making a little bit of money, and I thought, okay, if I'm making a little bit of money and I'm doing this part-time, I know if I focus on this full-time, I'll be able to t- at least pay my bills. All right? It's not about the money. It's not. A, I'm not trying to be a millionaire tomorrow. I'm not saying I'll complain if we get to that level, yeah. but it's like, it's not a focus. As long as I can take care of my family, my bills are paid and there's food in the fridge, you know, I'm happy. That, that's if, yeah, then you can do something you care about. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like that, I, I'm the same way and, or for, I think anybody, as long as you can get your basic stuff done and then, it, and then that allows you to work on something that you actually care about. That's, I think that's where we all want to get to. You know? Right. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I was like, you know, two weeks in, I was making a little bit of money and I just know if I did this part time, it would never be what it was meant to be because I'm too distracted by my day job or I'm going to do worse at my day job, right? Because I'm too focused on my passion. And so I had to make that decision for myself and for the company I was working for. You know, do I really want to half ass it at this company and end up with a bad relationship with them because I was working on my own thing while they're paying me? And I just felt like that was wrong. And mm-hmm. so, and I knew. No matter what, I wasn't going to start working on my side business at five. I'd be working on it throughout the day because we were all working virtually. There's no way that they would know. And so I just had to make the right decision for myself and my family. And it was a huge risk. I mean, I was making $90,000 a year, four Mm -hmm. kids. You know, I I have a big family, uh, expensive family. So to leave a $90,000 a year job to go and chase my passion and hope that it works out after two weeks of starting. Right. It was definitely (laughs) scary. What gave you that confidence after that two weeks that, that you could do that? So I've ran businesses since I got out of the army. Um, I got out of the army in 2011. I did about two years of jumping in between jobs, trying to figure out where I fit in. And I just realized after two years, I'm just not meant to be an employee. And so I built a couple of businesses, all of them. Um, some succeeded, most failed. Um, And I made a lot of mistakes throughout all of it. But one thing I learned after seven years of running businesses, you start to learn, okay, this is actually going to work or all right, this is a waste of my time. This isn't going anywhere. You learn when to, you know, cut your losses. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I've always had that path. I've just, I've been an entrepreneur since I was a kid. Like I would knock on people's doors at apartment complexes and charge them a dollar to take their trash to the dumpster. Right. It's just, I've had that inside of me since forever. What do you think draws you to the community building? 
part of it. I mean, it seems like that's the, this isn't the first community you've built, right? Right. This is my second. So the mm-hmm. first one was a community of military veteran entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. uh, another community that was underserved that no one was really going after. And I built the largest community for that too. And I think community building is just, when I was doing PR, I built a seven figure PR agency in a year. Right. And we did really well. And I made the biggest mistakes of my life through that time. Cause I'd never had that much money before. So I spent it on things I shouldn't have tried to be look cooler than I was. And it, it just it was a lot of mistakes. So I, I transferred over to community building because I like building communities. I like the fact that it's more personal. It's not so buy this from me and I sell it to you. And it's not so transactional. It's more relationship based conversations. And I just realized I just have a knack for it. I have this ability to bring together a community of people who are like-minded to create experiences that we all crave, right? As a military veteran that was an entrepreneur, I wanted to be surrounded by that community. I built the community. Uh, I made mistakes because I sold to the audience. And when you sell to an audience, uh, it's, it changes the relationship, right? So I wanted to do this one different where I sell to businesses and build the audience for free. So it's not, we have no membership fees, no dues. We have a Patreon, just like you probably have one or, or will have one. <laughs> well, you should. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have a Patreon where the guys who really enjoy what we do and the content we create can, you know, donate to it. It's not a nonprofit, but they can pay $10 a month and get access to behind the scenes. Things like, you know, you should definitely do on your podcast. And that's a way, that is not how we make most of our money. I do hope that one day that is. But for now, that's purely you can offer to pay money if you want to, but you can be here for free. And it changes the relationship dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I assume, are you married? Yeah. Okay. Um, How's your wife done with you starting this and then making this transition and then wanting and then quitting your job after a couple of weeks? She's gotten used to instability. (laughs) (laughs) Being an entrepreneur, you never have stability, Mm -hmm. like ever. It it doesn't matter how successful your business is. There's always going to be that time like COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you can take the most successful business COVID happened and it completely destroyed it. Like that's a risk that you take being an entrepreneur and she's gotten used to it over the years. Now she enjoyed, I had that job for about six months, the the salaried position and she enjoyed it. She enjoyed knowing every two weeks we had a set amount of money coming in. The taxes were already being taken out. Like health insurance. Yeah. Like health insurance was covered. Everything was good. Um, but I was miserable. So I just had to tell her, I was like, look, I tried to be that normal man, the man that gives you that nine to five, that provides you the health insurance and the stable paychecks and all this. And I was like, I just, it's killing me. It it is killing me from the inside. So she looked at me, she said, quit, quit your job, do this full time. I believe you. I trust you. I know you always take care of us. Cause even we've been very, very wealthy to very, very broke, but we've never been homeless. I've always found a way to make it work. Now it stressed me out. I mean, I'm bald now. right? So <laughs> I credit that to my kids, my wife and my, my job of being an entrepreneur, but it's just, she knows that no matter what happens, I will always make sure that we at least are surviving. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's good to have that support. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to building the community and deciding to, you know, not market to the community directly and instead, you know, sell to businesses sell the audience to businesses Mm. what exactly does that mean and like how how did you go about that like so i had to find a way one i had to become the largest community of dads in austin that was number one goal and so i found out the only other dad group in austin um on facebook was about 700 members and not a very active community so i saw that dad group and i was like all right so they're not very active you know it's kind of just like any other facebook group and i don't build my communities that way so I was like, my number one goal is to get this group to 800 members because then I can officially use the title largest group of dads in Austin. Uh, and so I did that within a week. And so once that week Jeez. came, it was just like, all right, now we are officially the largest d- d- community of dads in Austin. So that once I had that, then you go to local businesses, you know, the ones that serve kids or families or men specifically, testosterone clinics, lawyers and attorneys, dentists, chiropractors, all, you know, the uh, playscapes and all those places who, and I, I started at the perfect moment when these businesses needed the exposure because they're trying to recover from COVID, right? COVID hurt everybody. So yeah. once I had that, that's when I started going after businesses and I created two 
two tiers, right? You can pay monthly or you can pay annually. When I first started, I was like, let me just get a few partners in so that they can see they're not the first. So I charged $200 and I was like, you get advertised in two Lone Star Dads till the rest of 2020, right? Till the end of the year. And then once I had about 20 members come in for that, I changed the package to $397 for 12 months or $50 a month. And the majority of people pay for the whole year. And at this point, we've gotten 50 more customers at that level. So it's just, and it's a very easy sell. Um, what I promised myself is I wasn't going to overcharge because right now businesses needed help. And this, you know, I want my community to be a solution for Austin. And I wanted these dads to, the, the rule is you pay a fee and you have to give a discount to Lone Star Dads and a specific exclusive discount just to my community. Makes sense. I was wondering about that. So yeah. they, get, they get something out of it. Right. Yeah. Cause it's like, yeah, I'm going to get you in front of my guys, but they need to see your appreciation and your support for my community outside of just paying the fee. And so you have to offer a discount. It can be 5%. It can be 10%. You choose the discount, but you have to give one. It's not an option. And so no one's had it. I mean, we've had a couple of people who are like, I'm not going to pay and give a discount. It's like, okay, it's not the right program for you. Yeah. And yeah. the other ones have had no issues. Like, yeah, we'll do that. Some people <laughs> give a 50% discount. Like some people give a 5%, but it's done really well. So that was the model in my head was make sure it's a win, win, win. I get paid. The guys get a discount. The business gets exposure. If you can find where a, a situation where everybody wins, no one gets upset. That's, that's a good way to model the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So when you build the community, you know, it's obviously, it was like prime COVID time, right? Right. You know, three months ago. How do people start interacting with each other in the community and using it? So we had, um, we didn't do virtual. We followed the rules of the county, right? But we did, um, we went to places where we were wearing masks or we did outdoor things, right? Because outdoors, you can have that social distancing. You can keep your space. We did archery events. We did a, a happy hour, uh, like a launch party at a bar on 6th Street the night before they shut down bars again. And so that upset some people, well, one person in, in, in particular who got really upset because we did a happy hour. But the way I explained it to all my people, some of my guys won't leave the house. Some of them will, right? It's purely optional. We follow the standards that are given by the city and county, wherever we're holding the events. But it's up to them. You're a grown man. You can choose whether you want to attend the event or not. You have to decide what's safe for you. I don't mind being out and around people because I don't, I'm not around older people. Mm -hmm. I'm not around anyone that's at risk as far as health-wise. Now, I still wear my mask when I go out in public. When I go to places, I don't fight that. Like, I don't argue with any of that. I follow the rules that are set. Um, but we do hold the events where guys could get together, have drinks. We've done happy hours. We've done archery events. We did Austin ninjas and Cedar park. Um, we do horse riding experiences, have another one coming up on Saturday. So we get the guys together that want to get together. Everybody else just interacts on in the group. That's cool. I mean, that's really the only or the perfect way to handle it. And that's my approach too. It's like, you know, I was wondering if you were going to have trouble with that because you know how, how it is. COVID's almost kind of like politicized in a way. I yeah. mean, you've got, you've got this side, you've got that side. People get angry because these people are going to do this stuff. But then the people that are doing this stuff are like, well, we're following the guidelines. We're allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, to me, it's like, you know, mind your own business. Yeah. If, if people are following the rules, they, they can go and do that and do what they want to do and, and live their life. If you don't want to do that and you don't feel safe, then, then, then don't. Right. <laughs> don't say anything. And we have guys that have wives that have asthma who won't come out. Right. And, and we don't, I don't hate anybody for not wanting to leave the house. You have to do what's best for your family. but. The good thing about serving grown men is they get, they have the right to choose on whatever they want to do. They can come out or they don't come out. And when we do have events, we have social distancing and like the horse riding experience, we wear masks, we sanitize everything. We follow the restrictions and the codes of as far as how many people can be there. Like we follow all of the rules and we continue and we will continue to do that until COVID's over. Yeah. Yeah. So with the events and stuff like that, do you let the community come up with those things? Did you maybe start come up and coming up with those on your own first and then let people take it from there? Or are you making all of them? So I came up with the first ones to kind of get the group going. Mm -hmm. uh, normally it's our supporting partners. So our advertisers, we don't call advertisers. They're called supporting partners because they're a partner supporting Lone Star Dads. And it just sounds less dirty, you mm -hmm. know, it, it like less 
advertiser just sounds dirty, but supporting partner sounds positive. Mm -hmm. And so it's our supporting partners who will put on um, events at their locations. Like we have one coming up on the 19th, Salt and Time Butcher. Um, they have a cafe. And so we're going to do like a little happy hour at their location, following social distancing rules and everything else. Um, but sometimes it will be our partner. Sometimes it's me, right? The horse riding experience. My wife is a barrel racer in the rodeo. We have horses. So we go out to the property where our horses are and we get the kids up on the horses. That's What's a barrel thing. racer? A barrel racer. So in the rodeo, it's the girls on horses that go and race around three barrels and go back in. So uh -huh. they have to go like as fast as they can. And it's crazy, man. Like that woman gets fast on that horse. But, and I'm a city boy, right? So I know as a city guy, if I wouldn't have been introduced to the country, I would have loved for my kids to go see a horse for the first time or ride a horse. My kids have been raised around it. But for city kids, it's a cool experience. And the dads get to be around each other, right? And get to meet other dads that have similar mindsets or same age kids. Or For the longest time, it's always been the women set the play dates, right? And the men get dragged into it. That's right? true. So this is different. It's, this is the men having the play dates and getting the opportunities to meet other men without being dragged into your wife's friend and introducing to her, your wife's friend's husband. Right. And hoping that you get along. This is different. So it kind of makes it changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. So. You 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 came up with the events and you still do. And then it, it revolves around also the what do you call them? Supporting partners. Supporting partners. Mm -hmm. I like that. I mean, it makes sense because they they have things you can go and do because they are companies. Yeah. Um, how often are you doing the events? Is it a, a regular interval or? So we, we try weekly, but um, it's definitely been limited because of COVID. So we try not to do too many, uh, right? We don't want a lot of negative attention. The goal is for Lone Star Dads to stay a positive influence in Austin. And now we've expanded to Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and San Antonio. Right? That's what I was going to ask, ask yeah. you next is like, you could expand this all over. I, so that's the plan? Yeah, it's supposed to be a statewide um, organization, maybe eventually nationally. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's called Lone Star Dad specifically because it's Texas. So we definitely are focusing now on the expansion into other cities across Texas. But going back to the events, we do those. We'd like to do them once a week. We we'll probably do them once every two weeks right now. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do them more as COVID dies down. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that vaccine comes. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you know, clearly you've been an entrepreneur your whole life. Um, what are some of those failures that you had before? So I've got quite a few, the, the PR firm that I built, we hit seven figures in 12 months, which was insane. I mean, I went from charging people $40 for a masterclass because by the time I got to my PR time in my life, I had a couple of years in between where I was a public speaker for the army and I traveled the world and spoke on suicide prevention and resiliency on military bases. And going through that process, I had been featured on over 100 news outlets throughout those couple of years. And I did it all myself. I didn't hire a PR firm because it was an easy story. At that time, military suicides was a trending topic in the news. And so getting on the news was very easy for me. So I used all that experience of doing it myself. And I was like, all right, at that point, the government couldn't pay me anymore because the government was paying me to speak on these military bases anywhere from $5,000 to $20,000 a speaking engagement. Um, at that point, we they cut the budget, and I wasn't going to be hired to speak anymore. I want to back up a little bit on Yeah. So you were paid by the government to speak public, be a public speaker mm -hmm. around suicide prevention on military bases. Yeah. Um, and you, you were in the military yourself. You said mm -hmm. that. Um, well, how did you get the public speaking thing. Did I miss that part? No, no, I just, uh. I've, I've shared the short story so many times I forget to share it again. So I, there's four major hurdles I experienced at the time I was 23 and it's mm -hmm. prostitution, war, suicide, and murder. And so my mom was a prostitute and a stripper growing up. I was raised in the inner cities of Dallas, Fort Worth, trailer parks, motel rooms, everything in between. So I had a really rough upbringing and to, to escape my childhood and, and the life, I was a troubled teen, drugs and doing bad things. So I joined the army served four years in the army, did 12 months over in Iraq. So that was my war experience. When I came back from Iraq about a year later, I tried to kill myself and I took over 120 pills in less than two minutes. I uh, woke up in the ICU, whole newfound appreciation for life. Right. And uh, my suicide, a lot of people are like, Oh, that have to do with war. Not really. I mean, war 
was part of it. But war was the first time I felt purpose in my life, right? The first time I felt like I was a good person versus all the other bad things I had done. And so coming back, I just kind of lost that purpose. And then you combine that with my memories from my childhood. So one thing they say about PTSD is when you have PTSD from being a child, it sometimes can't come back until in your 20s. And all of a sudden, your brain starts remembering things from your childhood that you didn't remember before. So it was a combination of all that stuff that led into my suicide wow. attempt. And I survived it. Got out of the Army a few months later um, at my normal contract end date. I, I never planned on Army being my forever thing. The Army was my daddy, right? It was my way of growing up, manning up, and getting that punk teenager out of me. And it did that well for me. So I got out, and then I got out in February of 2011. In October of 2011, my mom was charged with murder. So um, she shot, what they say is she shot her husband point blank in the head while he was sleeping. And so she was, became the most famous, infamous uh, murderer in Texas. Um, they called her the Black Widow. It was on 2020, snapped, 48 hours, all that stuff. That was publicized everywhere. So from 2011... She didn't go to jail until 2014. It was three years of trials and investigations and everything. Were you still in touch with her at this point in your life? Yeah, yeah. So I had lived in Chicago when it happened. Um, mm -hmm. And then I moved back because the story was someone broke into the house and killed him and hit her in the face. And so I moved back to take care of her. And then it just went crazy. And so long story short, I ended up testifying against her in court because she had asked me to help frame someone else for the murder. And so I said no. I wasn't going to tell, you know, it's your mom. I didn't do it because it was the right thing. I, I ended up testifying because she ended up trying to pin the murder on my brother. And so then I went and testified against her in court. She was found guilty and sentenced to 30, 60 years in prison, 30 with good behavior. And so um, that whole experience was crazy, right? I mean, I've lived a soap opera life. And so having all those experiences led into being a great storyteller of Here's all these hurdles that I've faced throughout my life, and yet I'm still here. I've overcome. And so that became, that's how I became a public speaker, sharing that story on the military bases, being a veteran who attempted suicide while still in, serving in the military and experiencing all the other crazy things and overcoming all that. Yeah, I mean, coming from you, it's no, you know, you've been there. The best person to speak on something is, some, you know, someone that's been in that situation. People right. listen. Yeah. But wow, that's um sorry to sorry that happened to you man i had no idea about any of that uh, it made me appreciate fatherhood so much more right it mm -hmm. made me appreciate family so much more i mean my goal in life is to make sure my kids never live an ounce of what i lived in my life and i think a lot of dads feel that way, right so it's like on my shirt it says break the mold break the mold for me is break the mold of what i was raised in change the way my children are raised from you know my dad wasn't around when i was a kid so i'm a very active dad um you know, my mom was not a good person, so I made sure that the mother of my children is a very good person, um, and I spend as much time with them, and I teach them all about life, and I make sure they don't have to face the hardships that I did. So that's called breaking the mold, change, change the way that they're raised from the way I was. Totally agree with that. I wish that, unfortunately, it doesn't, some people don't look at it like that. They, they fall into the same pattern that affected them negatively, right? instead of taking the opposite approach. No, don't do that. Don't, don't keep transferring that down. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's good. And that's cool, man. Break the mold. Yeah. So I did that for a few years and I traveled to Japan, South Korea, Hawaii, Alaska, all over the United States. And I got to travel all over the world speaking and getting paid to speak. And it was an amazing experience. But at this time I was still a, an angry guy, right? I was sharing the story. Like I was this perfect human, uh, and like my life was perfect, but I was having a really hard time with my wife because I hated women. I mean, I hated women because of the woman who raised me. Right. So I just, I had a lot of anger and hatred in me. Um, and so that was a whole experience, but it all led into, Hey, we can't pay you anymore. So I had to figure out what's next. And I'd been on the news so many times and it wasn't about my mom. I'd been on the news a few times about my mom, but I didn't count that. Right. Like, that's not my story. That's her story. The, the hundred times I was on the news was about veteran suicide, military suicide. I became what they consider a subject matter expert. So every time it was in the news, like the Chris Kyle case, um, they quoted me on that. Like, does PTSD, do you think the guy had PTSD? And he had a flashback when he killed Chris Kyle. And every time PTSD came up, the news came to me. So I started a PR firm because I was like, I figured this part out. And I did that and built a 
$40 masterclasses to $5,000 a client to $10,000 a month. So I had about five clients at a time, or I'm sorry, 10 clients at a time paying $10,000 a month each, or sometimes they paid $30,000 ahead of time for a three month contract. So I was making money. And the biggest mistake I made in that business was spending it, right? I wanted to feel successful. Cause you I feel like you made it. You did yeah. all this hard work. I'm here. Yeah. I was so broke. I was raised so poor that when I saw that much money, I mean, my first $80,000 a month, when I saw the deposits in my bank account, $80,000 in one month, I have never made $80,000 in a year. And I made $80,000 in a month. And I thought, that's my money, right? Not that's my business's money. That's my money. So I bought, or I was renting a, a 3,000 square foot office in Austin. And I had five employees, right? I had, I was flying first class to every, I was still speaking, but now I'm PR. So I was flying first class everywhere to meet with clients or, or do a speaking engagement. I bought a Rolex cash. I was just, I was just living the life. I was hanging out on yachts with rich people and going and drinking wine. Like I was living this life all while my wife is at home raising my kids and I'm spending no time with my family for the cost of that Rolex. I could have taken my kids on the most amazing Disney world trip, right? Instead I went and bought a Rolex. So I, I spent all the money in ways I shouldn't have. I didn't pay my taxes. I, I made a lot of mistakes in that time. I made mistakes with people I, I needed to refund and couldn't refund and because I had already spent the money. And it was just like I made so many mistakes, man. It was just, it was definitely a learning experience. I'm a better man today than I was because of it. Yeah. But, um, it was definitely, <laughs> it was cool to have that experience at that time, right? To, to live the life and see the other side from what I was raised. And I mean, you did learn a lot from that. And it also put you in a place to where it showed you like that money could have been spent elsewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and like, you know, saying like, you know, you could have taken the kids to Disneyland mm -hmm. and now then it probably helps you not crave that stuff as much. Cause like you kind of went and did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have this burning desire to spend the money when it comes in anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I don't need the Rolex anymore. I don't need that, that high lifestyle. Like, Right now, for me, it's like, yeah, I want to make more money. I think all business owners want to make more money. But for me, what I want that money for is completely different than what I wanted it for before. And before is I want to fly first class. I want to, I want to get in a private jet. I want to you know, have that Rolex on my, on my wrist and, and just feel good about myself because of how much money I make. Now it's like, I want to take my family on trips. I want to take them. I've been to Italy. They've never been. I've been to Europe. I've been to Japan. I want to take my family and, and go have those experiences. Now I want to spend my money, not the business's money, my money on experiences, memories, right? I don't, I don't even want to buy the kids things. Like I buy them toys and stuff for their birthdays, but we spend more money on trips now than we do on materialistic things. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't know about you, but from my childhood, even though it was a horrible one, there are those good memories that I have from the few times that my dad was around, we went fishing. I remember that trip, right? So. The memories are something that the kids will never lose interest in, right? A toy they play with for a week, but a memory is there for a lifetime. Totally agree with that. There's a saying around that. I don't remember, remember what it is, but invest in memories. I always tell my friends, we talk about that. You invest in memories. I mean, you're yeah. not going to, you have, you're going to drive your cool car or whatever, but that's not your, what you're going to remember or care about in 30 years. Right. You know, you're going to, your life is the sum of all the things that you remember doing with the people that you love and care about. Right. Not that's, all the shit that you compiled. Yeah, that's my <laughs> life now, right? I wish it would have been when I was making that money. We could have had some great experiences. <laughs> but it's, it's all right. Now my focus is I still want to make money. I still want to succeed. But it's just for a whole different reason than it was in the past. I'm going to take a short break and check, check and make yeah. sure everything's recording. Man, there's been a lot. I can't believe we've covered all of this. And just it's only been 33 minutes. <laughs> Here's I don't think I said it like this. I don't like this. Yeah. So. Well, what, what would you use it for? I, I want to do a podcast of interviewing dads on their stories of overcoming and triumphs and mistakes and all that stuff, right? But I don't want to interview famous people, right? I think too many people focus too much on the famous. There's these guys out here, like me, who live these crazy lives or have learned these amazing lessons but everybody wants to hear from a celebrity when it's like, I don't care about the celebrity. They're just a human being that got really good at their job. I want to hear from a dad. Like, I want to hear what, they, what they've experienced and what they've learned throughout their life. 
Yeah, I can see that being a great podcast. I mean, a lot of people, everyone has, you know, different unique life experiences and mm-hmm. what they've gone through. It doesn't, not, they don't have to be famous or anything like that. And sometimes it doesn't have to be about success. Sometimes it has to be about struggle, right? Sometimes we just want to know, like, we're not the only screw ups. We're not the only ones that has faced this hardship or that hardship or deals with a kid who, you know, says they hate you or, you know, it's just like, sometimes we just need to feel like, all right, I'm not alone. Like I'm not a failure. I'm not the only one going through X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to do. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you be consistent hosts and just have a different dad every time or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I like this setup with the cameras and the microphones. Like I like that. It makes it more personal versus just the audio. Right. I agree with that. Do, doing video to me makes it a lot more fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and like some, I've had people listen to one and then watch, watch the same one. And they're like, it's a different conversation. I mean, when you can see people's facial expressions and yeah. stuff like that and Spotify is starting to, I'm just, there's something popping up here. I'm just going to close it. It's bothering me. <laughs> no worries. Spotify is starting to launch video on their platform since, you know, they bought JRE. They bought Joe Rogan's podcast. Oh, Did wow. You hear about oh, that? yeah. So I heard yeah. That, like for a lot of money. Right? Yeah, yeah. No one knows what the official amount is, but they're saying 100 to 200 million. But yeah, doing video makes it more fun. It's more of a pain in the butt, honestly. Mm-hmm. But um, if you if you decide to set up your podcast or whatever and you want like to ask me about all this stuff and tell you like i can help you yeah just save you some time will. i'll hit yeah. you up and be like <laughs> i need a shopping list <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i can i can come up with one yeah at a pretty low cost and if you want to upgrade it from there i mean a fairly low cost yeah. right well, this is perfect i don't need anything more fancy than this yeah i would say I, I agree like you don't need to really be much more fancy than this right I and mean, after that you're just being extra fancy <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm okay with basic now yeah, yeah, yeah. The only thing that I would like is a thing right here that shows me the cameras because, as you see, I worry about them and I yeah. have to check them sometimes. Right. But so you gotta have those cameras that attach to your phone. Yeah. But yeah. circling back to the mistakes, it was funny. I, I talk about how I succeeded. Right uh, mm-hmm. at the end of that PR company, I had to pawn my Rolex for thirteen hundred dollars to pay one of my employees' um, paychecks, and then I had to sell my ten thousand dollar video setup. Cause I had a whole studio and video set up too. I had to sell on my $10,000 studio for a couple grand to pay another employee's paycheck. So damn, I made like, I went from way up here to crash you, and burn. You really went hard. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> you really I, went did. Hard. <laughs> I did. And I learned so much in that time. And it's funny cause I don't think people talk about that enough. And that was recent. I mean, that was 2017, right? So it's like, it wasn't that long ago. And no. There's still people today that hate me because of my mistakes from my PR days. Right. So it's like, and it's a consequence I have to pay for the mistakes that I made, but I'm, I'm better now. Right. I'm definitely a different person than I was then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. So you did have employees in that company. Mm -hmm. I had at any given time, I had six to 10 employees, um, six that were local and maybe four, you know, VAs from the Philippines or whatever, but I had six employees and I, I learned a lot being a boss. Like, Sometimes I was too much of a friend and not a CEO um, because I hated being a boss. Right? It's just not, I don't know, man. I don't like it. Um, so it has a little awkwardness to it. It does. It does. I, I mean, I can lead a community, but leading a human it, besides my kids, is just, it's hard. Like I just want to be able to tell you something and just be like, yeah, you should do that. And just, it'd be done. Not have to harp on it or supervise or, you know, just expect a, an adult to be an adult and accomplish what they need to accomplish. Um, and I had employees, uh, there were times where I had to pay my employees a couple of days late and you know, it just, just got hard. And so what I decided since then was like, I want to keep employees to a minimal where it's more like contractors or people that, you know, 1099 workers, not full blown employees. It's just not my specialty. If I ever got that big, it would be like I'm hiring a CEO to run the business and I, I do my thing because I'm just not, it's just not me. That's not your thing. No, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just not uh, hiring, firing and dealing with all that. Watching people cry when you fire them. It's, it's just like, ah, this isn't, this isn't me. Yeah. Yeah. At least you recognize that. <laughs> so how long have you been in Austin anyway, since, you know, it's an awesome podcast. I like to talk a little bit about how people got here and, and why they're here. Yeah, I got here in 2012, so it was after my mom had gone through the murder stuff, or in the middle of it, really. Uh, I moved out here to get away from her and all of that, so the media was chasing us, and this was after she had asked me to help frame someone for a murder, 
and I just had to escape. And I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, but I came down to Austin for Marley Fest. And that was in April of 2012. And after I came down here, like the next week I moved down here. Because I was like, and I think that's how most people moved to Austin, at least before COVID. It was like you come out for a festival and you just realize Austin it's a whole different city in Texas. Like it's not Texas. I feel like it's the California of Texas. And so I was like, I, I like this, right? It's diverse. There's all kinds of people. You can see people from suits to dreadlocks to everything in between. Uh, it's weird. It, it's different. And so I moved down here and I moved in. I got back in touch with my dad who lived in Round Rock, moved in with him for like two months. And then I went to Craigslist and found an apartment that, this guy was subletting a room out of, and it all went from there. So mm -hmm. I haven't left Austin since. And you met your wife here? Yeah, I met her uh, in 2013. Yeah, 2013, I was working at a DME company, a durable medical equipment company in South Austin. So I met her there. I met, she started working at the company at the same time I was quitting to go on a speaking tour. So we met her, I met her. We dated for two weeks. Then I went on a three month long speaking tour and a tour bus across the United States came home and she got pregnant 11 days later. So we were dating for like, we officially spent like three weeks together before she ended up pregnant uh, with my firstborn. Wow. So, and I mean, and when was this? How many years ago? 2013. 2013. Yeah. And, well, you're, you seem to be doing well. You're defying the statistics in that regard. Well, we didn't at first, so <laughs> we went through a lot. I treated her like crap, man. I, mm. I treated her really bad. I emotionally abused her. I never physically abused her, but I emotionally abused her because I hated women, and so I treated women horribly. And so she she got the brunt of my trauma from my mom. All right, she had to pay the consequences for that. Um, so we went through custody battles we went through courts we went through fights we went through every the cops being called like everything you can imagine it was a very toxic and negative relationship for a very long time but we kept fighting uh to make it work and we kept fighting to make it work we split up we got back together like two or three times um and then today is definitely a whole different relationship than it was seven eight years ago right so going on eight years is definitely different than it was back then that's really good to hear that you know it is possible for a couple to go through those crazy early struggles based on, you know, some past stuff, mm -hmm. work, work things out and then be in what's would seem to be, you know, with you got four kids now. Yeah. Yeah. Four and kids. I had to give her credit for that. I mean, she shouldn't be around, right? She should have left me a long time ago with the way I treated her, but she stuck around and she toughed it out and she helped me become a better man. And it would, I think what changed me was realizing I'm about to lose my family and being raised the way I was family has always been the most important thing in my life. You know, I want, I wanted to create a better family, but I realized I was creating a similar lifestyle that I was raised in. Right. And in a way I was rebuilding my past mm -hmm. and I was, and that's why I break the mold came up. I was like, I'm just recreating the same toxic lifestyle I was raised in. Why do you think that she decided to stick it through and see and see if it could change? Do you think that she saw that maybe it was some past stuff and, and you could get past it or what? I think at first it was sympathy, right? Uh -huh. It was, it was feeling bad. Like she knew my life. She was in the courtroom the day I testified against my mom. So she knew the crazy life I had been through. And I think that made her more accepting of the emotional abuse that I gave towards her because she would understand why. I felt that way towards women. And so she always told me, like, I just, I know there's a good man in there. And I know he's in there. I'm just waiting for the day that he finally comes out. And so she stuck in and, and she fought through it the best that she could throughout all that stuff. She just, she saw something in me I didn't even see myself. That's great. Yeah. Does, you know, the past stuff with your mom, is, is that like a sensitive subject with you? Is that something that still bothers you? Because you said that people were chasing you down, like you, People, media people chasing you down. Is that kind of no longer an issue for you? It no longer is. And so what happened was last year in July, um, my wife was pregnant with our fourth and um, had a miscarriage. And so he passed away inside of her um, at 12 weeks. And so when he passed away, I, I've learned something in my life. You turn every negative into a positive. And it sounds bad saying it when it comes to a baby dying, but you, you have to find a message and everything, right? So when I saw that, it just opened my eyes like, this is a message that I need to be a better father. I need to stop working so hard and spend more time with my family 
So I saw that and I realized the only way I can become a better father is to get rid of my anger. And the only way to get rid of my anger is to face the memories from my childhood and the biggest issue in my life, my mom. So he passed away in April of 2019 and my wife had to do a DNC. So in July of 2019, I went on a walk and I walked from Zilker Park in Austin to Gatesville, Texas, where my mom is in prison to forgive her. So four days, I walked 80 miles every, you know, 20 miles a day for four days, stayed in campgrounds. I did what the Australians would call a walkabout, right? It was, it was a way of facing my childhood and my past and my memories because something the army taught me is the only way I face emotions is if I'm physically exhausted. Because if I'm not physically exhausted, I'm, I'm fighting them, right? I will fight those emotions. I don't cry. I refuse to do any of that stuff. Like, I just don't cry. And so I had to face those emotions. The only way to do that was to physically be exhausted. So I did that in July in Texas, 100 degrees every day, walking along the, the feeder road of 35 up on my way to Gatesville, Texas, and sleeping in campgrounds on a mat, you know, in a tent every night for four, for four days. Holy shit, man. Yeah. Well, for one, I'm really sorry that you and your wife had to go through that uh, experience of losing a child. And, I appreciate that. Um, also, so you, you, you were, did you plan this? Um, yeah, I didn't prepare for it, but I planned it. So I had no physical prep, prep, you know, preparation for it. I hadn't ran or done a ruck march since I got out of the Army in 2011. So it had been eight years since I had done really any physical exercise. And I think I just kind of lost it. I just kind of realized like, man, I have to turn losing my son into a positive. I have to find a way to turn this into, I can't have his death mean nothing. And so at least I can turn it into a positive by using his death to become a better father to the ones that are here. And so I just decided and it was like two weeks of getting all the supplies I needed. And I just, Went for a walk. In Cave, you covered that one, too, mm -hmm. uh, when I went for my walk. Well, I got to say, I love that mindset of turning a, n a negative into a positive, regardless of how horrific that negative may be, mm -hmm. and still keeping that mindset. I mean, it's a powerful way to, to, to think about the world and to live your life and, right. and to just make your life better and make the people around you make their lives better. When as men, when you go through a circumstance like that, your job is to be strong, right? You can't, you can't be emotional because you have to be there for mom because mom just went through it in a whole different way than any man could ever experience right to have the baby you know taken out from inside of you and it's not around anymore and you didn't get to meet the baby and it was growing inside like the connection between a mom and a child that they're carrying is so deep that you have to be strong so i would only cry when my wife was asleep when she was awake i would hold her and comfort her and be strong i had to right so this was my way of, of giving myself permission to face the pain and the feelings and, and the negativity that came with it. Um, but after everything I've been through in my life, I've learned that like you have to find a way to turn it into a positive. Like it, it's just, and I'm not sitting here saying I'm some guru or Tony Robbins or anything. This is just when you face enough crap in your life where it's like nothing can surprise you anymore. You just realize like life isn't going to stop punching you. Like the blows aren't going to stop. You will never be ready for the next thing. So you just have to find a way to, to turn it into something great. When I think about my son now, I don't, I don't tear up. I don't cry. It makes me happy it's because when he passed away, it turned me into a better father for the ones that I do have here. And so we ended up getting pregnant again, and we have our fourth now. And it's a beautiful little girl who's three months old. So Congratulations. Thank you. So with Lone Star Dads, where do you see things right now? Um, What's next? What's next for me is the expansion into the other cities. Austin's doing really well. It's gotten to a point now where it's kind of organically growing itself. Um, so next is expanding into Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston, the other three major cities in Texas, right? And go from there. Um, what we're doing now is using a vlog to grow. So what I do is I travel around Texas and I give these free experiences to dads uh, and I make a vlog out of it. So I helped a dad face his fear of heights by jumping out of an airplane here in Austin. Uh, I helped another dad make his seven-year-old son's dream become a reality by flying in a biplane here in Austin. What's a biplane? A biplane is the smaller airplanes with no roof. So uh, like you can feel the air and all that stuff. Cool. His son was uh, you know, addicted to biplanes, but you know, he wasn't going to be able to give him that experience. So we surprised him and did it. Uh, we sent another dad 
and his wife here in Austin on a date night. They hadn't had a date night in 10 years. So we partnered with a babysitting app to provide the babysitter. We partnered with a black car service to provide the, the transportation. And we partnered with uh, Carried Away, which is like this floating dock on the lake. And we did the sunset package where they get anchored by the Congress Bridge at sunset and watch the bats fly and have a picnic on the lake. Awesome. Um, so we did that one. This Friday, we're giving a, a dad and his four-year-old daughter a date night. So we're showing up in a limousine taking them up, taking them to Mueller Lake Park to go have uh, a picnic in the park and then taking them in the limo back to the house. So it's literally a daddy-daughter date where she can dress up in her princess dress. Daddy's dressed up nice in his nice clothes, and they go have a little picnic together, right? So we do that a lot in Austin, and now we're expanding and doing it for a dad. Uh, we get a dad in Dallas who wasn't able to take a vacation this summer we gave him a free trip to a river resort on the Frio River from Dallas. So I'm meeting him out there with his family. And that resort gave him the biggest cabin, and they're stocking his fridge full of food. So we're going to document that. We gave a dad in, um, in San Antonio. He wanted to take his kid uh, fishing for the first time. So we gave him a free trip to Rockport, Texas, and a free fishing experience where they're going to get out on the ocean and go fish, uh, deep sea fishing. And that'll be the kid's first time fishing is going to be on a boat in the ocean, which I thought was really cool. And then tomorrow I'm calling a dad in Houston who's battling cancer, and we're giving him a free RV trip. So he's going to get a free RV. Uh, Outdoorsy, who's one of our supporting partners, gave him $500, is giving him $500 to use on an RV to go on a trip wherever he wants. So that's what we do now. That's my vlog as I travel around and do this. Dude, that's awesome. That'd be so rewarding. That's the the dopest job right <laughs> it makes you feel so good man so i i came up with this i watched this video on youtube and i, I watched it a couple years ago and it's i've been it's popped up in my head every now and then since then and this guy goes and he knocks on people's doors and he pays their rent um these people have never heard of this guy before he's literally just knocking on strangers like, doors. free rent yeah he's like hey how much do you pay for rent here i'm thinking about moving in and they they tell him and he pulls out a lot of cash and gives them their rent cash and ever since i watched this like man that would make me feel so good like i want to do that one day well now i'm doing it in a, in a different way i'm not just giving people money but i'm giving them experiences with their kids that both them and their children will never forget that's awesome dude i love it man. so what about this ranch as well yeah, I mean, yeah. we haven't touched on this so the ranch we are looking at buying well we are buying 15 acres of land in lampasas and this 15 acres where's lampasas it is north west so it's west of colleen okay um and so land passes it's 15 acres i'm sorry 18 18 18 something like that right it's a lot of acres yeah yeah, yeah. um and we are turning it into we're buying it because my family wants to go move out to the country the city has just gotten overwhelming for us um you know we live in leander right now and in the past two months there's been two helicopter assisted foot chases around my neighborhood there's been a drunk driver who literally ran into my na next door neighbor's yard and hit their tree. If that tree wasn't there, he would have hit their house. Um, there's been cars being broken into. There's been, it's just, the city's gone crazy. And it's, I just got to get out of there. So I was like, we got to move to the country. But every decision I make isn't just for my family now, it's for my community. It's like, all right, well, that's going to be my house and where I live. But since it's my house and where I live, how can I make this benefit Lone Star Dads? And I was like, well, We'll make it a great escape where dads can get their kids to unplug, get off of the iPads, the iPhones, and just come and ride horses, learn archery, shoot guns, fish. Like, we're going to build a pond where you can fish. Like, just, just escape the city world for a little bit and get away and come visit the property. So we're building that. And the cool thing, how we did this was I was buying the property, and I was like, you know what? Let's get the guys involved. And so I was like, how many of you would – Offer to come out and, and, you know, help me clean up this ranch. It's not clean. It, ne it needs a lot of work. And so over 200 of my dads have volunteered to come out and fix up the ranch. So after that, I was like, all right, so for the dads that can't work, we're going to offer, if you buy a shirt and uh, a bumper sticker or a window decal, we're, you know, for 50 bucks, you're going to have, you know, access to come out to the ranch and spend time with your kids without any additional fees or anything. And 50 guys bought that package. And some, I, I made it where they could donate more. Some dads donated up to $500 for the ranch, right? So it was like the guys, you know, have be, been really engaged and involved in making this 
a reality. And it's going to take time to do the closing, make sure we get approved and, and finish all everything we have to do with buying land. Um, but we're really excited. Like it's, it's going to be called Lone Star Dad's Ranch. And it's going to be a place for dads across Texas, not just Austin, across Texas to come escape, give it through kid and just be in the country. Dude, I need to have a kid soon. <laughs> right? <laughs> tell, tell the wifey or girlfriend, like, hey, time to knock you out. <laughs> just so I can be in Lone Star Dad's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, that's awesome. I love it. The whole thing's great. Um, man, finding a way to just like, your, your income is based on making other people happy. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's the, that's gotta be the best. Oh, it's the most rewarding thing. And I tell my wife, so I always, I talk about everything I do, but there is a selfish reason behind it. And the selfish reason for me is I want, when I pass away that when I have, when they have a funeral for me, that it's like sold out, like it's just a packed house. It's a packed house of every dad and every child's life that I impacted from giving them an experience or whatever it is. When I pass away, I want my kids to see that you can make money and make an impact at the same time. And I want, cause before all my kids would have written on my tombstone was, has a great work ethic. Cause that's all I had. I want my, what my kids to see when I pass away is how many lives I truly impacted. That's my selfish reason to doing what I do so that my kids can see and look up to me even way beyond when I'm gone. That's a good reason. Right. <laughs> I feel like it's a good selfish reason. That is a good selfish reason as far as selfish reasons go, for mm -hmm. sure. So, uh, Andrew, is there anything else you want to say about Lone Star Dads or yourself, your life, anything? Yeah, if you know a Lone Star Dad, if you know a Lone Star Dad in Texas or a dad in Texas, tell him to join. Outside of that, I think it's important for everybody, male, female, listening to this, whether you're a parent or not, I think we all don't appreciate family enough. We don't talk to them enough. We only see them on the holidays. We only call them every now and then if they live somewhere else in Austin. We have a lot of transplants here. Family is so important, and you don't want to get to that time in your life where it's too late. I, mean, I live every day of my life as if it's the last day on earth. I could, get, I could leave here get in a car accident and never see my kids again. And I want that. If that happens, I want my kids to have nothing but great positive memories about me. I want my wife to feel nothing but love towards me. Um, you know, when we are angry at our family, we have to solve that problem now. I think family right now has become so distant and so easy to disown or just stop talking to each other. When you get upset about something, if there's anyone in your life right now that you're upset at and that's in your family that you haven't resolved the issue, Call them today and solve that because they may not be here tomorrow or you may not be here tomorrow. And leaving unresolved issues is never the solution. That's a great advice, man. Thank you. Thanks. This is, this is great. Um, wow. There was so much more to this than I ever thought there would be <laughs> when, when we started talking. And you and your background is incredible. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See ya. <laughs>